in the Julius Knippel series, there is this man who walks through the strip, basically. Sometimes he has nothing to do with the story. He doesn't even, he doesn't realize what the strip is about. So he's not um, even a participant. He's sometimes a bystander in the story. But it connects, it's people week to week over many years would come back and say, okay, there's this familiar figure, you know, it's like my, reminds me of my uncle. I know where I am in the world. Maybe without that, it's harder to put people to uh, anchor themselves in, in a comic strip. But, so you said uh, that's why I killed him off? So, so well, I I thought that the character was kind of upstaging me as the author, and I wanted to put the kind of the narrator ahead of him. <laughs> and I mean, it was so many years, I just thought, where is this, I mean, why does he have to, he didn't, he, it was sort of a struggle to get him into the strip. And I said, this is crazy, I'm, like I'm, uh, you know, a union requirement, he has to appear, there was no. So I went from there to a, a series called the Cardboard Valise, which was an imaginary travelogue, to a story called Hotel and Farm, one week about hotel culture, the next week about agriculture, and I'd alternate those. And then I went to a series called Shoehorn Technique, which I can't even explain. But, um, you know, I don't think comics or, or any of these forms should um, be places people feel too comfortable or too cozy. I wanted to sort of make, disorient my reader a little bit so they'd, they'd sort of read it and go back to their own life and, I don't know, not, um, not get too, uh, too cozy with the thing, feel too at home in, the, in my strip. So that was a kind of decision. Uh, so off, off, on the off chance, is, it, is this related to the ideas of defamiliarization? Yeah, I wanted, um, I wanted that kind of, uh, you know, awakening. Otherwise, it's like a stupor. What is re immersing yourself in a work of art or of storytelling? Or is it, a, is it an opiate or is it a sort of you do it? like a cold shower and you wake up and you go on with your own life and you say, well, what does this have to do with my life? And that seems to be, in the short form, that's why I like short form comics. I think this, the graphic novel is a strange development. Uh, it's because publishers think they know how to sell novels. They both never knew how to sell short things because they're not sellable there. You read them and you go, you know, they're not um, big objects, so. so and that, who, who else? Who, any, any any graphic novelist that you're that you're a big fan of? Oh yeah, no. There's a whole the fact it's an approved comics are an approved art form now, and so like in the 1950s, you had thousands of young people writing poetry. You now have thousands of people making comics. And they really think of themselves as poets or kind of serious fiction writers. So there's a, I mean, it's, it's an exploding field. Um, there's uh, some a friend of mine who's now based in England, Peter Blegvad, who did this strip, Leviathan, uh, in a paper in London. It's amazing. You know, he's a poet, he's a musician, he's a cartoonist. These, he's uh, crosses these boundaries. Um, there's a, a, a team of um, artists. Yeah, go ahead and there's a team. team of artists, Rupert and Mulot in Paris, who work together. One is not a writer, they both write and draw. So they're not the traditional disciplinary specialties. And they make these amazing uh, comic strips and one of those just came out in English, uh, called A Barrel Full of Monkeys. The history of 
the academy, these kind of purified disciplines happened in the probably back in the 18th century, and there's you know they because these things work differently. Um, there was this logic that they belong in different pure. You can purify these forms, and um, that works for prose and it works for single images. But when you get into the world of theater, um, you get into this idea of narration shift, a story shifting from narration to a, a moment in the present, you know, a, a mimetic moment. And there's a long history of theater being graphically documented in books. Go from play scripts, just the text, to ways of indicating how that text should be spoken, to images showing sort of an opening scene for each um, act of a play, to more complex things, toy theater and um, picture recitation. And um, it seems that that's at least what, what comics seems to come from for me is that that graphic notation of the theatrical event and that kind of shifts between narration to the to actually seeing a thing happening in the present moment on a, like on a stage so um, as a book it built it's my books are reviewed in book sections they're, they're part of that culture because not only because they're physically books, but they're about storytelling. And, um, you know, they don't fit in the theater world because they're graphic notations of these events. If, when I stage them on a, put them up on a stage, they're reviewed in the theater section. And what culture, you know, your work ends up in is kind of a, an interesting question. But um, the, tr the sort of, arc of where paint, you know, pure visual art went is that the story became either a side point to it or completely irrelevant and um, became, you know, what uh, uh, Duchamp called this kind of retinal work. It's, you, you shut your brain down in some way. I mean, it's ridiculous. You, nobody, your brain doesn't work like that. You. You look because you want to look at something. <laughs> you're, if you're hungry, you're looking at food. If, you know, you, these things are not purified impulses on any level. But that world, which still goes on, you know, it's the gallery world and the, the um, art world. Uh, I'd say still storytelling is not central to that world. I mean, it's overrunning it because people want to use those devices because the other devices are kind of lead to dead ends historically the purification of painting you know led to uh um you know new uh, barnett newman i mean these kind of dead ends aesthetically there's it's great for him to end painting and it was great for duchamp to end art but that doesn't leave anywhere for young people to go they say, well, this is a dead, this is the, uh, I live too late in history. Art is finished, painting is finished. But, uh, you know, in theater, even minimalist theater leaves openings for new, new things, new works. Uh, so just to add one more thing about the, uh, the the idea of these kind of net recordings of theater. Yeah. Is it like storyboarding that happens after the, after the fact? Or well, is it, is the, it storyboarding before the fact? There notations they can be done after the fact they can be done as plans for some directors draw out their plans for a play I mean it works either way in the history of recording documenting theater um, you know this is all pre photography once photography happened uh, Brecht made his these model books where he shot moments from his plays so you could actually say this is what should be happening at that moment, how the stage should be set up. So pre-photography, um, set design, you know, sets, 
circulated around for decades. They'd be reused, and they kind of did, they had a permanence. And you would say, well, we'll pull out this set and use it, or we'll invent a new set. And then, um, and in Victorian theater, there's that whole history of novels being adapted to the theater. And they would look toward the illustrations. That's when, you know, fiction still had pictures in it, illustrated books. And so you'd look at Crookshank's images from Dickens and say, those scenes have to be in this play. You can't do the play without those moments. Um, and that, you know, that's um, that tradition, the, uh, the illustrated book, because of this educational division of skills and disciplines, you had writers and you had picture makers, very few people doing both. Um, Thackeray and a couple of people, uh, du George du Maurier could do both. William Blake could make pictures and write. But, um, you know, the, the Academy kind of wanted to sort of um, control it. Certain people couldn't do everything. You could do what you could, what you was meant to do in your status in the society. You were a craftsman or you were an intellectual who used words. And um, so that history is kind of not a happy history. You have the image maker upstaging the person using language. And, um, or the illustrator feeling he's dependent on a writer to make a book, you know. And there was a real hierarchy, and the writer was always higher in that hierarchy. So the, the kind of um, generation of people who, I think it's, who wanted to do both somehow, who grew up in pop culture, these things were never separated. Movies and comics and theater. They, you, you, you try to do both, and um, that's kind of where we are now, where they're being sort of accepted in what was a pure literary world as this, you know, it, they're, they're uh, just a little wider use of the spectrum of meaning. You know, like we don't see most writers' handwriting, and that graphology and looking at handwritten manuscripts was kind of an interesting field of uh, study. People like to see what these. Do you think that the that this kind of emphasis over the last decade or two in academia on the interdisciplinarity uh, has made for the, the kind of flowering of the graphic novel? As uh, no, platform? I think what you know the academy is at this point is chasing the culture. They're not setting the standards for the culture. And this is just what's happening in the culture. And if they don't address it, they're completely out of touch. And I think one of the problems with interdisciplinary uh, work in schools is that if you have people who were brought up in these discrete disciplines, they can't, they don't do it. And they don't that's just not their practice, and uh, they can try to move into these things. And but it's a, you know, it's a self-perpetuating thing, the the academy. As and so I think it's the academy chasing the popular culture and trying to figure out, you know, why is this so lively? Why are these such interesting forms to people?